but the mind neuroscientifically is programmed for habit and programmed for addiction. So those are potentially polar things, but they're also working together towards a space of wellness. It's just that addiction and habits perceive that their ability to help us be well is through reactive programming. You're listening to Entrepreneur Journeys, where I share insights and strategies based on owning and managing businesses while traveling and living on three continents. I also interview business owners about their journey, what they learned along the way, and how that can help you with your business growth. For more resources to accelerate your entrepreneur journey, head over to gapologist.com, where I share resources, events, community, and more. I'm your host, Joe Matz. Let's get started. Today, I have with us Paige Frizone, and she is a subconscious health practitioner. Welcome to the show, Paige. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me, Joe. It's going to be a great conversation. Always fun to connect with people with all backgrounds from all walks of life. So thanks for having me. Yeah. So I'm glad you mentioned all walks of life. I mean, this podcast is about the journey, the entrepreneur's journey. And speaking of journeys, where do you hail from today? So I'm here in the mountainous Boulder, Colorado. I've been here for close to 10 years and I'm originally from the Midwest, but I'm here for the sunshine and I just can't leave. (laughs) Oh, I love Boulder. I almost went to college out there. Oh, that's awesome. That's amazing. I went to, um, I finished my schooling at Naropa, which is in Boulder, but it's not the school everyone's familiar with in Boulder. So. Right. Right. Still, you're in the beautiful place, Uh, mountains, snow, beautiful summertime. That's great. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's just can't get better than sunny winters and snow that melts the next day. And it's the environment that really holds so much of the healing work that you'll find out here. So I love everything about it. Sure, sure. And so you went to school there. Did did you then get out of school and start your own business? I did. It took me, you know, I would say, so I was in and out of school for five years here in Colorado, but I started my schooling journey in Indiana, believe it or not. And I took myself out here, went to a Buddhist inspired university, had never meditated in my life. It was a completely different experience. But this school was so unique because you didn't really major in math or science. It was very right brain oriented. So you would see a lot of yogis or creatives or writers like myself. Uh, You'd see a lot of people training to be therapists in psychology. And I minored in psychology as well as a result of it. It was a really unique space. And then the last semester of my schooling there, I had delved into psychology really heavily. And I took this approaches to healing class that introduced me to Eastern medicine traditions and a lot of integrative health studies. And I had only been experiencing Western medicine for a long period of my life, separate from my own spiritual practices and stuff like that. But I didn't have a ton of knowledge about other modalities of the world in treatment and in healing until, you know, the latter couple of years of my schooling experience. And It took me a lot of studies with a Zen priest, actually. My mentor was a clinical herbalist. I did botanical medicine studies with her. We would go to the mountains and make medicine of the wild flowers out here. And I just had one thing lead to another. I became a practitioner shortly after that, and I started my business. Well, that is so great that you found early on that you were on the the wrong path or, or that there was a better path for you. Yeah, some some people go decades before figuring that out. I mean, I know. And I always say to people, I've lived a lot of lives in my lifetime. I, you know, my mom was a nurse. And so there's always Western medicine orientation in my on my side of the family. Uh, My upbringing conditioning was all pretty much Western. And at the same time, I had a lot of like spiritual influences, which isn't the same as Eastern medicine, but a lot of people mistake or misperceive certain energetic concepts with the spiritual, which it has that lens for sure, but there's also science rooted in it. So I really love bringing a transpersonal perspective of the integration between science and spirituality, what it is to be a human with consciousness, what it is to have a soul and a spirit, and how we're really here to heal on a cellular level. So one thing has led to the next. And being a writer as well, I was so in my mind. I was so stuck in the mind. And 
you know, I learned about the difference between the conscious mind versus the subconscious mind. And it perpetuated this beautiful bridge of awareness regarding how we create, which is through our conscious choosing minds. Right. That's what controls what I say on paper. And then like the subconscious mind, which is actually dictating 95% of our experience, our emotions, our behavior, our patterns of thought and our symptoms. And I just needed to go deeper because I wasn't getting to the root of my own trauma, let alone be able to be of service to anyone else without a, a better understanding of the brain. So would you say before you went to this Buddhist inspired school, would you say that you were searching for something or did something find you? Oh, I love this question. Both 100%. I have been a seeker my entire life and writing was my first love. And I think that was how I was seeking originally was like, what is the meaning of life? I struggled for a long time in my life with depression, anxiety, eating disorder. I had a lot of dis-ease. And so I was struggling to stay on the planet. Like I didn't get it. I didn't understand. Didn't huh. I didn't get it. I had a very linear view of life. I was like black and white. Humans are the mm -hmm. only people on the planet that exist. At the same time, I'd been being, you know, attacked at night with like entities and spiritual things that I didn't understand. And so I was trying to figure it all out and putting pen to paper was the way that I did that. And it wasn't until I was 20 that I had my first spiritual awakening. I was in a treatment center. And I think that's the first moment that I would say something found me because I heard voices of this gibberish language, whatever was coming through. And it essentially said, love body to make art. And I didn't know what that meant. And still to this day, it's one of the mantras that I always come back to because it can mean infinite amounts of things. But Throughout my life, it's this very meta, you know, experience of I've always been a seeker and I've always been on the path, but there have always been things working to find me on my path as well. So it's kind of a catch 22 type of energy. Right. And and I think that's very important. I love how you you wrote to understand. It sounds like you wrote almost as a self-inspection or, or introspection, I want to say, um, type of activity and exercise. Absolutely. And poetry, I always say poetry was my first language. I see the world better that way. And I love, I actually just did the speaking event and I shared a poem that I have had published in a small press for a while because you don't, no matter what the form of art is, you don't have to consciously, accurately understand what's being portrayed in order for you to subconsciously feel something. And so it made sense to me and that's all that mattered. But now that I'm like in a healthy space and of service to others, I'm able to create differently because it's not just about me anymore. It's about helping others through whatever they might be experiencing through that same inner subconscious resonance that we all share. Yeah. And, you know, I kind of think on our own path of evolution and spiritual evolution, if you will, everyone's path is different. Everyone's journey is a little different, but I find I'm, I'm beginning to understand within you, part of that path of spiritual evolution is in the giving and the helping of others along their own path. Yeah, 100 percent. And for me, it's very karmic because I struggled. I was inhibited for so long being on a therapist's couch and just longing to be on the other side of it. And that's a little tricky and a little dangerous because I think it can create spiritual bypassing where you're skipping steps at the expense of being in your experience, where you need to be in your integrated embodied self. You can't cut corners and healing like you got to go through it, you know. And right. so I struggled because all of my favorite people on the planet were professionals who seemed to have their stuff together and knew what life was about and they weren't struggling. And all I knew was struggle. Hmm. And I felt like life was meaningless without my ability to be of purpose in a career oriented way or in a professional way. And I'm very career driven. I'm very much, you know, innately a healer. I think we all have those capabilities, but the path of the wounded healer that you might archetypally hear in the world is that you have to go through your own journey first. You have to go through your own shadow in order to be able to be initiated into the world of service. And so I, I do feel resonance with that journey as as the journey that I've had has been very much that. Yes, but, you know, because Paige, there, there's learning in going through challenges, in going through difficulties. There's learning. There's also learning in books and learning in the classroom. But the learning of experience and the learning of going through 
something, especially difficulties. Unfortunately, we tend to reflect more on those than, and we tend to celebrate the successes, but we really ponder the failures and, and the str struggles. You can't get that in a classroom. 100%. You know, and yeah, you, please. You learn how to deal with it. You know, one of the, you reminded me of one of my favorite sayings and it, and it's this, it's wherever you are, be there. All we have is the present moment. And so many people are in a physical space, but they're mentally somewhere else. Or they're working on something and they're multitasking. <laughs> and I think meditation has helped me with that, to be present, to be there. And um, I think that that is so important. You're going through an experience and that experience is there for a reason. Absolutely. So, Go ahead. I'm just resonating. Like I'm taken directly back to a lot of the Buddhist inspired literature, a lot of the meditation, right? Like observing thoughts, mindfulness based techniques are based on exactly that, which is witnessing your thinking patterns and just mm. naming them as dreaming or feeling or judging or whatever it is that we're experiencing. And wherever you go, there you are exactly what you said. There's also a Buddhist inspired philosophy of like when you eat eat when you walk walk when you talk talk when you you know uh jog jog and just practicing one thing at a time is very counterculture from this go 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 hustle and bustle multitasking energy and life is the stuff of the present life is what's happening only here and now and that's why i love studying the brain too because it's a wild place. It's a labyrinth of infinity where with one thought you get to go in the future or go in the past, but none of it actually exists except for what's here now. So it's beautiful that you bring that to the table. Yeah. So let's talk about people who may be where you were when you were not where you felt you should be and you found something and something found you. What would you suggest to people who are feeling like they need to be found by something or they need to find something? Oh gosh. Yeah. Like everyone's spiritual experience, your higher self, your intuition, your guidance, your reason for existing. These are really deep existential seeking questions. And I know that without the right support, they can spiral any one of us into crisis. And I love studying the difference between like spiritual emergency and spiritual emergence, because depending on the support that you receive, you might end up in a space where you're feeling really bad about feeling bad. And we want to make sure that, you know, you feel supported in whatever your journey is. And so if you're struggling with anything, depression, anxiety, trauma, addiction, you're really looking for that higher purpose. Uh, I say just know that so much of it is energy based because everything hits our energy body before it hits our physical body. So if you can work to break habits just to break habits, try new things as much as possible and notice the energy shifts as you go, it will start to elevate and it will start to sustain itself. But everyone's journey is so unique and there are such unique subconscious programs that are that are influencing what you might be experiencing. And so there are ways for us to get those answers, uh, which is the process that I practice and offer people as well. And so what I love about what I do is that it, it's essentially an emotional processing system that incorporates 14 different modalities from Eastern and Western medicine together. And so you don't have to go to zillions and zillions of practitioners in order to get to the root of why you might be struggling with what you're struggling with. And even though there's spiritual backing, or sorry, even though there's scientific backing in what I do, there's also spiritual components. So I see clients all the time that are struggling with why they're here or what the purpose is or what their reason for being is. And it's not my job to give anyone that answer because it's unique to them, but it is my job to be a guide and help support as they're going through that shadow. Right. I think each person needs to find that for themselves, but it's also difficult to do that by yourself. Would you like to get in front of more of your ideal clients and at the same time, build your brand and create evergreen content? Well, you can do that with podcast guesting. This very moment, you're listening to a podcast that may have been published today or three weeks ago or three years ago. In a very real sense, you're engaging with the speakers, hopefully enjoying yourself and learning something new at the same time. And you're getting to know the guests and how they help their clients, their customers, and the problems that they solve. 
You may even be their ideal client and want to learn more about them and download one of their free resources you can find in the show notes or maybe even become a client of theirs. See, when you're a guest on a podcast, you will enjoy that same kind of engagement. It is perhaps the easiest, most cost-effective way to get in front of new audiences. Learn how you can be a guest on the right podcast and engage with your ideal clients with the free resources available at gapologist.com. But you did mention new experiences. So would it help if someone who always takes the same road home from the office takes a different road or or going to a new restaurant or, or a new, I, I don't know, buy a new flavor of ice cream? I mean, what what can we do? <laughs> I, what what can we do that's that's an easy step but might have some serious and, and important impact yes yes to all of those suggestions I love that so much um I love suggesting to people go to your local library like if you have access to wisdom uh go to a library and I see library visits as psychic readings, no joke, because if you ask different sections what you might be looking for, what you might be needing, just being in the existence of a book without even reading it switches up energy because you're contracting that experience. So ideally you would read the book, right? Whatever it is, but go to a local library. Yes, change up your routes and routines of how you get to work. Call someone that you don't usually talk to Um, journal if you don't journal or listen to ambient music and keep it in the background of whatever space you're working in because that innately elevates what's going on neuronally in the brain. Go for a hike, go for a walk, like all of these things we hear very topically in the world of self-care. But from a neuroscientific standpoint, there's value here because we're programmed to be habitual and habit equals addiction. We're all wired towards some type of attachment or tendency with our life that keeps us stuck. And we're not going to think our way through how we feel. We're not going to think our way through into the subconscious because it's hidden under the surface. So when we break habits, just to break habits, we're working a muscle of self that needs to be present for us to heal. So when you're working that muscle of self by choosing, you're consciously saying, I'm going to go for a walk in the sun, or I'm going to go lay outside and just read, or I'm going to go listen to a guided meditation. And these are new things that you're trying. You're exercising this muscle of newness that's going to energetically shift what your body is programmed to do every single moment of monotonous days. Hmm. So you want to try new things and it's going to be experimental for a while until you locate what works for you. And I go through phases too. Sometimes I'll be doing yoga and then I'm like, eh, I'm good. And sometimes I'll just, you know, do walking instead. And then I'm like, eh, I need to switch it up and I'll start jogging. And we're all supposed to be switching it up all the time because we are designed to change, even though we're programmed to forget that we're designed to change. So we resist it, we struggle with it, and then we get stuck in the mind. And the mind is really expressing what you know is going on under the surface, and that might show up as symptoms or ailments or disease. And so those habitual patterns and breaking those and reprogramming, that's what it's all about. So I'm hearing a, something contradictory. <laughs> Mommy. Yeah. So you say we're we're do, we're habit driven. We we are made to do habits, but then you say we're designed for change. Mm-hmm. So I'm I'm feeling a little conflict there, Paige. <laughs> it's good, and this is brilliant because spiritually and from a consciousness standpoint, we are polar beings. We have dual parts. Okay, and so we're not all one thing all the time. But the body is designed to heal regenerate and be whole no matter what the body is programmed towards healing so we perceive through our mind's eye which is not accurate it's perception so it's programmed it's conditioned we perceive that we are uh that we are not designed to heal right we have beliefs that tell us otherwise we have diagnoses we have people reinforcing these limiting experiences and at the same time physiologically and scientifically and cellularly we are here to heal When we have symptoms, we perceive that means illness. It actually means wellness. It means we're expressing health, Mm -hmm. right? So in the same way, we have internal elements, fire, earth, metal, water, wood, and air, just like you'd find in traditional Chinese medicine, the five element theory. We have all these elements within us. So we can can say we have this inner landscape or this inner nature, right? This inner nature. That's why external nature, our planet, the elements of mountains and water and beach, all these things are so valuable to us as humans on the planet because they're reflecting to us our inner landscape. 
So that's where we go to heal. We go to nature to feel that spiritual connection. We go there to breathe in the oxygen that gives us life, just like the trees, right? So we have this ability, just like the planet, just like nature, to acclimate to change. Just like water goes from liquid to solid to gas, we also have the ability to acclimate to difficult circumstance or to acclimate. Every time the body is expressing symptom, we're acclimating to adversity, right? neuroscientifically is programmed for habit and programmed for addiction. So those are potentially polar things, but they're also working together towards a space of wellness. It's just that addiction and habits perceive that their ability to help us be well is through reactive programming. But the mind, does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah, that helps. I mean, it's they, they do seem like they're on polar polar ends of a stick let's say and but there's there's some confluence there i can see that one going to the other and the other leading learning leaning towards the other and on that continuum but i'm glad you said the body has ability to heal to heal itself because you know i'm a mountain biker and the tree all the trees rocks twigs and the grounds that i've hit and broken bones i've had i i would look like a jigsaw puzzle with with a couple pieces missing if, if the body didn't heal itself. Absolutely. I mean, we are self-healing mechanisms, but we also have battle wounds. We have scars to prove our life stories and experiences. And, you know, uh, sometimes we'll fracture a bone and it won't grow back just the same, but it's working its butt off to make sure that we can still be mobile and it wants to be mobile. It wants to come back to base. And so that doesn't mean there aren't other conflicting elements, but so much of those conflicting elements are actually emotionally rooted. And so the emotional programming that we get stuck in keeps us from truly being able to perceive that we're designed to heal. So once you heal the emotions that are under the root of the physical, the physical starts to heal. So we just kind of have to get out of our own way, which brings us back to the existential conflict or consciousness of our existence. Right, and I think there, there's so much. I mean, I've always considered ourselves spiritual beings having a physical experience. And, you know, so many people focus on symptoms. Mm-hmm. And it's it's the symptoms that make us aware of things sometimes. And then what we have to do, in, in my view, is to find the cause. Because solving for the symptom, that can give you uh, endorphins, adrenaline. It can give you that good feeling. You've done something. You've sol- But if you don't get to the cause, it's, it's going to come back again. And I, some people I, I've seen throughout my journeys, they've worked on symptoms m- numerous times until finally they realize, hey, this thing keeps coming up in my life. I better get to the cause. They don't say that, but that's their feeling. That's, that's where they want to go because they don't want it to present itself anymore. 100%. If we don't get to the root original occurrence of whatever that memory was, that's continuing to trigger us into perfectionism behaviors or uh, chronic autoimmune conversations in the body or thought patterns of low self-esteem. Like if we don't get to the original memories that are responsible for why that's the thing that it is, why that's here at all, it's going to keep showing up. And so I like to treat it like a game of whack-a-mole. It's like you hit one down, two more things <laughs> pop up, you know, and you're trying really hard to like navigate everything, but how about they don't pop up at all, right? How about we actually get to the roots and foster that tree from the ground up so that we can grow to our fullest potential? It's not even possible. It's just what it's supposed to be. What it's supposed to be, yeah. And I, <laughs> I know, uh, you know, a number of business owners who are playing whack-a-mole. They're not getting to the cause because getting to the cause sometimes can be painful. As in, you're look, you're you're going to look at things that you've always believed to be true and that they should be this way. And when you decide to stop looking at things the way they should be and look at things the way they are, that can be emotionally painful. Would that be right? Um, yeah, I think some people don't think it's pleasant. Some people don't think it's pleasant to face what's what's truly happening. And I love therapy, but in a way, therapy can keep us talking out of our feelings and keep us in that control center of the 5% of the brain because it's more comfortable to talk our way out of it. And so many people, most people are really smart and really self-aware. We all have the ability to know what our patterns are and how we feel about those things. But again, just because it's unknown 
to journey into the root doesn't mean that it's more painful or more unpleasant than it would be just talking about it. So we may as well like actually be shifting. We may as well be doing the work from the bottom up so that these things are lifetime impact, meaning they sustain themselves and you don't have to keep going over it over and over again. Yeah. Okay. And Paige, what would you say your superpower is? My superpower. I, okay. So for the human design people of the world out there, you don't have to know what this is, but it's essentially like astrology plus quantum physics on speed. It is a complete language that is worth looking into. Human design has different types of people. The type of person I am is called an environmental projector. And so all different types of people have all different gifts. But being a projector, I essentially can like see through realms and I can feel what's going on with somebody without them even telling me. Hmm. So it's like intuition, but even more so. And so being an environmental projector means I essentially can chameleonically become what's around me. And so if I'm in nature, I can like become nature. If I'm with a person that's struggling, I can like become that energy. And it's such an amazing skill because it helps me transmute whatever somebody else might be experiencing who's in my space, who's in my energy field and clarify that energy for the collective betterment. So I have loved not just having this information about myself, but using it on the day to day and knowing how to refine it because it kept me stuck for a lot of years, not knowing how to deal with boundaries energetically and stuff like that. Uh, I was severely disempowered as an empath and I took on people's physical stuff and it wasn't of service to me. But now that I get it and now that I play with it, it's something that I feel people are really drawn to about me. Yeah. And what is the transformation that you provide your clients? I have seen night and day. The transformation that I provide clients is knowing that they are not their diagnosis, is knowing that they are here for greater purpose, is knowing that the light, not just the dark, but the light is their baseline and that they become what Abraham Hicks would call vibrational snobs, where we can't even tolerate anxiety or depression or a thought of malice or shadow energy anymore when we get to a place where we know we're designed to heal. And so the level of expansion, energetic empowerment, holistic, integrative wellness creates this standard of living with my clients where they won't even be able to identify with the person they used to be. Yeah. Interesting. Very nice. This has been a great conversation, Paige. Yes. Thank I, you so much. Yeah. Thank you. Is, is there any words of wisdom or action steps you'd like to leave our listeners with? I would just like to encourage everybody listening. Like there is reason for why you are the way you are. There's reason for both the reactions that you're having in your life that you would never choose to experience. There's also brilliance behind them. So just my guidance would be to be so curious, like do your best to work with the parts that are judging, the parts that are struggling and listen to them as if they're like inner children that you have because they have needs and requests that need to be heard by you. And so really working to like remove the layers of, of the judgment or being mad that we're mad or being sad that we're frustrated and just going for the root, like asking questions, compassionate inquiry. What age does this remind me of? What memories are coming up right now? What feelings do I have about it? What does this part need from me right now? How can I start making those better habit choices and creating new energy in my life? So I had a professor once say to me the questions, uh, the answers are in the questions. And if you ask a lot of those questions, you don't need a conscious answer because the mind's gonna get stuck in those answers but just be with what's underneath and be with the liminal space and then energy will start to shift. Okay, great. And if people want to know more about you and, and um, they, want, they want more page, they, they, they resonate with what you're saying here, they wanna know more, what, where can we direct them? Yeah. So I'm very active on social. I have tons of free content and resources for you there. So my handle on Facebook, TikTok, and Instagram is at inner realm wellness. So two R's inner realm wellness and my website, www.innerrealmwellness.life. So I have tons of more information on there as well. Okay, great. We'll have all of those links in the show notes. Very good. Well, thank you so much for sharing with our listeners. Thank you. It's been amazing. I really appreciate diving into multiple realms on any given day. So thanks for having me. Thanks. Bye now. 
Thank you for listening to Entrepreneur Journeys. Remember to subscribe so you catch all the episodes and check out the show notes for any free giveaways or gifts that were mentioned during this show. Entrepreneur Journeys is brought to you by Apexable, providing the insights, tools, and transformative structures to help you reach your business summit. I'm your show host, Joe Matz, and until next time, I hope your journey is filled with breathtaking views and successful outcomes.